I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. I am overviewing all of wondrous wisdom, and I'm doing that today with Thomas Gaidosik, my dear friend, uh, who over the years, uh, starting in 2016, um, but has been so kind um, that I've been able to visit him and talk for four or five hours at a time, presenting my research results in theology, philosophy, um, math and physics, personal growth, and uh, really always being uh, received with um, great, uh, wonderful interest and support. And that means so much, uh, working so independently. And then to say, uh, I'll, Thomas, I'll let you introduce yourself, but just to kind of say from my point of view, uh, well, one, the mind, he's a theoretical physicist. He teaches quantum field theory and general relativity. Uh, he's a teacher and a researcher. So this idea of like the kinds of things his mind grapples with, uh, there's some affinity with wondrous wisdom, I think, uh, maybe. And then um, certainly as important is, um, and this is quite personal, but just Thomas's deep faith in God, love of God, um, uh, devout participation in Catholic uh, Church, and uh, you know, uh, so all of that is very dear to me uh, because uh, that's where I'm coming from myself, uh, and so this very humane uh, willingness to, with lovingly hear me out as I grapple with you know, as a free person with these theological challenges, with um, life challenges, uh, that is very loving. And so uh, this is all uh, wrapped up in Thomas, and that's how I introduce you, uh, why it's so special to tell you, um, and what more can I say about you? Well, I th I think it might be enough. I don't see myself as big as a researcher, a teacher, because everything is connected in some sense in mathematics and it's not that mathematics is not that difficult so mm -hmm. and so this is a kind of the, uh, the concepts are more difficult the big concepts i think are more difficult and mm -hmm. this is where i have to learn to listen and think about it myself but this is why i enjoy also listening to this philosophical ideas that you present. And so um, I do make a distinction. There's math for wisdom, but what is that wisdom? And it's the math is for the wisdom. So the philosophy I've been working on all my life is called, um, I call it wondrous wisdom because my name is Andres and it rhymes with wondrous. So that's the deep reason. But um, it's not really mathematical. It's pre-mathematical. It's conceptual frameworks, cognitive frameworks. There's a whole language of them. I call it a language of wisdom. However, uh, because it's so um, unfamiliar to people, it should be familiar because I think that describes our human life, but it's so foreign to people in terms of thinking about such things. I've been, um, and I have a PhD in mathematics and these things do appear in uh, advanced mathematics. And so I'm appealing to advanced mathematics often, uh, but not, not really today, but often in order to try to get people to acknowledge, oh, there's something real here. So I'll share my screen, um, and um, this is uh, an overview I've been preparing um, because of Jerry Northrup. So in our small uh, but very uh, vibrant community, uh, Jerry Northrup uh, leads our Language of Wisdom uh, study group. Um, he is an expert and a pioneer in eco-technology, and you, you will be familiar with him from um, uh, videos. But um, I prepared this vocabulary because he's trying to understand my uh, language of wisdom and I'm trying to understand his and we're trying to see how they might connect, uh, which is not trivial. Uh, so I wrote out um, this page here and it links to other pages and we'll be going through this uh, in probably a, a couple of hours uh, if, if I go fast enough. But there's probably like 150 concepts here in bold. Um, and I'm just dashing through this, and then we're going to get to the very end. And the very end here uh, says uh, interpretation, God's investigations, and humans' investigations. So kind of like that's the topic of all of wisdom is how to connect God and human. And the idea 
is that in the big picture, uh, we're both investigators, uh, that God is an investigator, then human is an investigator. And uh, we each have um, four levels of investigation, it seems. I would, you know, I would try to argue, um, you know, or, or present that claim. And that somehow they're related, these investigations. So that's where I want to come to. And we'll be going through all kinds of structures, but um, the investigations by God, I call them sciences. They're these holistic 24-fold frameworks. And so um, like whether there is a God, what is God, how is God, why is God? So starting off with this question, like is God necessary? And thinking of this primordial God who says, well, let's see what, you know, like, like removing himself and seeing what happens. So, um, and meanwhile, that would lead to the appearance of a human um, and so this human uh, is grappling with their own question, like how to live eternal life, how to live by wisdom, how to live by goodwill, how to live by God's will. And in each case, it's kind of like reaching back to some kind of a mysterious God um, beyond. Um, and so those, I think, are related. I'll try to talk about that relationship. And so this is, um, this is a picture, and um, we'll see what can make sense. And so when I've been presenting, I'll just start out with the section by section I'll go, and then Thomas, uh, you'll comment. Uh, but um, in this small community, Math for Wisdom, I'm trying to explain that, well, there's this whole language out there. So I make, so first of all, I make have this term language of wisdom, which is a conceptual language that models human experience, how we experience our lives. So that it's a language uh, that is prior to words. So even before, uh, infant has any verbal language, but they are experiencing life and probably pretty much the same as we are, you know, in some sense. Uh, uh, so it, there's feelings and there's thinking and um, there's uh, deliberateness and there's um, being not in control, all types of things. So um, similarly, I think that there's human experience that we live is not... Um, it's not really uh, primarily about words. Uh, words are very secondary in my outlook. And that is something that's just tremendously difficult for me to get across to some of our participants, uh, some people. It's just amazing like that how people are used to thinking that what exists is words. So this language of wisdom is basically trying to, and so whereas, for example, Jerry Northrup is someone who has independently, you know, developed his own language of wisdom. He calls it relational symmetry paradigm. So I give a brand name to mine is wondrous wisdom. And I want to distinguish four different levels uh, where it is um, fitting together. So one thing that will be coming up all through these, um, this, this uh, session is uh documentation of cognitive frameworks. So I'm trying to say there's certain limits of the imagination that um, just run into that, like free will versus fate. You have these two ways of thinking. And why do we have these two ways? We can't get rid of them. There's not really a third way. There's something about those two ways that creates a holistic structure. So I would call that a cognitive framework. Now, uh, we had a very good meeting of our steering committee uh, and Kirby and uh, Daniel Friedman and uh, Jerry were um, all there. And Kirby and I agreed, OK, let's collect cognitive frameworks. That would be very helpful. Now, it turns out that I don't think he really has a sense of what I mean by cognitive framework. He means something very different, maybe a philosophical perspective, uh, philosophical outlook. So. It's very hard for me even to explain what do I mean by cognitive framework, but I try to make some examples and some non-examples. So, and then there are, of course, many things that don't even qualify as non-examples, but it's basically a set of concepts. Typically, um, they may have structure with regard to each other. So a very familiar classic one is, let's say, Hegel has thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? And so when I say that's a cognitive framework, I'm trying to say, well, that in some sense, intrinsically, inherently, um, innately maybe, that's a complete set, that it's covering all the possibilities and they're relating to each other and the logical or, or metaphysical structure is such that just nothing else will fit. It's just kind of carving things up, carving up the possibilities. So these are, now these may be valid or not valid. These may be true or not you know, true, these different ones, but at least the, the ones I've listed here kind of qualify as worthy of consideration. 
in the sense that maybe they are absolutes. So I'm looking for uh, absolute truth. I'm looking to know everything. And how do you formulate that? These are building blocks for that. These are like baby steps towards that. Just, But just some non-examples, like you could have north, south, east, west. Uh, you could have like a butterfly has an egg, a larva, pupa, adult, let's say. You could have earth, fire, water, air. There's just so many things that you can, you can have a length, width, height. Uh, but the issue why these are not what I would call cognitive frameworks uh, or conceptual frameworks is that um, they don't have that uh, sense of necessary uh, completeness. They're not really candidates for being uh, universal absolutes in our internal sense. So um, something like north, south, east, west, you know, if you're on the North Pole, well, what's north? Right? <laughs> It's not clear. And, or what's east and west, you know, or if you're in the center of the earth, you know, what is east, west, south? Or if you're in outer space, what do these things mean? The whole thing falls apart. Or something like um, summer, winter, spring, fall. Um, if you live on the equator, those things just don't really stand defining because of the way that the sun goes across. It turns out that the sun goes overhead twice during the year. So it's like you have two summers and two springs, basically. This whole thing... So just to say many of these things, um, they're not really uh, possible frameworks for making strict definitions. So one of the maybe the whole purposes of these cognitive frameworks is that they're, they're being basis for definition. So I've made my point at least as much as I can try. But I want to say, so I'm building up this language of these frameworks saying this is real that or, you know, or is it real? Let's collect them. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about that reality. Once you have collected a lot of them, you start to see how they fit together, how they kind of like um, reflect the mental actions and how they change and 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 uh, and uh, reappear, etc. You get all this cognitive machinery. Then there's this idea of interpretation. What's the theory? So the frameworks are kind of like the facts. What's the theory that would make sense of that? And for me, uh, that's a lot about the big picture. And so. Uh, I'm a Roman Catholic by upbringing and, you know, maybe by um, just belonging, let's say, and I, and I, I by obedience, let's say. Um, it's, I, 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 it fits with me, but maybe more importantly, just the notion of God, you know, the relationship with God is extremely um, uh, meaningful for me. So, and it's meaningful personally, but also philosophically, just the idea of, like if I erase myself, if I erase everything, a lot of this philosophy is about just erasing things. Like what doesn't matter? Just don't think about it. Think about the only thing that are left. So that's very much kind of leads to a notion of a self-standing God and what in terms of the limits of my own imagination, what that could possibly mean. So when I'm looking for a theory of fitting everything together, it just keeps, for me personally, keeps coming back to the idea of God. What does this say about God, all this machinery? What does that imply? And the image I sometimes use, like, I'm in the prison of my mind. Why would somebody put me in this prison? What is that all about? You know, and so then that turns it around. Um, so that's interpretation. That's a constructing a theory. And it's different than collecting facts. So just to keep that difference in mind, a third thing that I'm becoming more familiar with because I'm working with um, people in our community is what I would call context. So context for sharing facts and theories so that we in this world can share our understanding with each other. Basically, there's certain things that um, are just helpful because maybe people are more in the world, so to speak, than I am with my thinking. They reference the world. So if I can show in the world certain things, um, or in disciplines, uh, what people are familiar with, they may be able to see what I'm talking about. Maybe that's an example would be like in advanced mathematics. Uh, if I can show bot periodicity, right? Like that the, there's this eightfold mathematical cycle. Well, maybe that's the same as these divisions of everything. They have an eightfold cycle. If it's the same, basically, structurally, I've, I've given a video about the Yoneda embedding, showing that relates to the foursome. So that's not saying that the Yoneda embedding is something I came up with uh, documenting cognitive frameworks. It just says that those cognitive frameworks somehow are appearing in different places in mathematics, and that's one place where they appear. And if you treat the Yoneda embedding as important and you can see cognitively this is helpful, then you start to get evidence to say, oh, this is not random, these, these uh, whether, what, how, why, these four levels of knowledge, but that that's... Uh, that's something real to think about. It's definable in mathematics. We can use math to define it. But another example would be what I call the three minds. So 
if I say, okay, uh, I see from the cognitive frameworks from this eight cycle of divisions of everything, I see three operations. You can add one perspective, you can add a perspective on a perspective, you can add a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And then I start to realize and think about it and look at other, what other people are doing. And I say, oh, well, psychologists, uh, Kahneman and Tversky talk about system one, system two. That seems to be like these operations that I'm saying plus one, plus two, plus three, they seem to be like the unconscious and the conscious or what they would call system one and system two. And I seem to be saying there's a third system, system three, which would be consciousness, which would kind of like balance the other two. And so all of a sudden I'm hooking into, let's say, psychology, maybe neuroscience. So that's context. And that's kind of like what maybe Math for Wisdom is all about, is trying to um, connect with people in some kind of context. But it's really outside of the facts and the theory. And then a fourth layer that's important uh, in, in our community. And I, when I was organizing independent thinkers, um, Minchu Soldas was my laboratory for, from 1998 to 2010. I was helping develop a culture of independent thinkers. And very much so we're doing that now today. And so that means that people are, you know, I'm focusing on people, their personal growth. I'm asking them who they are, what's their deepest value in life, which includes all their values. You know, what are questions um, that they're investigating? Uh, what's their relationship with truth and these different types of things? And, uh, you know, certain principles may be in our interactions. Like, so we want to interact in the public domain. Um, we want to uh, have everybody succeed. Uh, we understand uh, that uh, money can bring people together, but you can't pay people to care. There's certain basic things in the culture. So this whole culture um, has a reality. And that reality um, gives us reference points. For example, um, based on our relationships with truth, we start to see uh, interesting things that that connects with our deepest values, that uh, we all have the unique, basically, relationships with truth, but we all seem to be talking about the same truth. We seem to have a notion of a landscape of truth that's basically the same for all people. It's kind of very curious, just like if you walk on the planet Earth, you know, it's one Earth, but we're all in different vantage points. So these types of things... Uh, that's a fourth thing. And so that helps us um, connect with each other, but it also helps us um, share a reality where this wondrous wisdom becomes relevant. It kind of cooks, connects and interfaces with the wondrous wisdom. And so a question and investigation that comes up, one is like how to show the extent of reality of wondrous wisdom. So I think I just mentioned that the, the context and the culture are part of that. And maybe another question I would add here is, um, uh, how to get across what a cognitive framework is, because we've had big challenges with that. So those are examples of questions. Comments here, Thomas. What do you think? I think it is somewhat a nice introduction. On the other hand, it's... If I wouldn't have heard that from you several times, I'm not sure if I would have been already lost. <laughs> And that's yes. why this is advanced wondrous wisdom, yes. because we've had beginning yes. wondrous wisdom. If you've watched the meaning of life, I would count that, you know, so beginning of the beginning level wondrous wisdom is the two, some three, some four, some. OK, so Jerry Northrup wrote a wonderful letter today where he's starting to apply this in maybe like a, you know, a first step type of way. So but, you know, this is the two, you know, this is how I'd use the two, some three, some four. So that's what we're going to start. Um, but then if you've been watching mm -hmm. the meaning of life uh, videos, you, kind of grappling with the technicalities of how the threesome and the foursome fit in and they, they become related to representations of the sixsome, you start to see that there's this machinery that's actually happening. But now like this is the symphony of all the machinery, the overview. And so that's why I gave this introduction about Thomas, like why is he the person I want to talk about? So now in terms of context, um, this something I've been finding helpful is this notion of three minds. Um, it's certainly not something I uh, started with. And so it's a nice example of something that kind of developed out of this machinery. And so the three minds, uh, the simple way I call them is unconscious, conscious, consciousness. And I'm using the words in the kind of like the English vernacular or American vernacular. Um, so I really try to just use the concepts that seem to be the most every day. Um, but in the point being that in English, when we say conscious and we say consciousness, it does kind of mean slightly different things. So that's very confusing. 
but conscious might be like the awareness, first level awareness, and consciousness is kind of like a higher awareness. We'll make that more specific. But uh, one way to think about it is that there's a perspective, a perspective on a perspective, and then a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And this relates to having people. So like first person, I have a perspective. But if I think of you, I'm saying that, well, I'm thinking that you can have a perspective and that's my perspective on your perspective. So that's a perspective on a perspective is built in when I talk about you. As soon as I talk about you. Um, um, whereas if I empathize so strongly with you that it was, well, I, Thomas, right? Like, then, well, that's just uh, I. But typically with I, you know, I, it's more removed. And then if somebody watched us from the side, um, they would be an other, let's say, right? Uh, so they could see us interacting. Uh, we might not see them. That'd be a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. So that's first, second, third person. And so one of the things that uh, comes up in the structures uh, that just kind of naturally... And this is a little bit like maybe like theoretical physics and math. Sometimes in physics, because it gets expressed in math, math suggests certain things. So this is kind of similar. The structures suggest certain things. And so they suggest, you know, God would make sense as a zeroth person. And so then sometimes uh, you would have these three persons, but typically you have the four persons. And so, like I mentioned, uh, there's these three operations, plus one, plus two, plus three. And the questions and investigations collect all manner of evidence expressing and suggesting these three minds and understand the broader significance of these three minds and the chain of perspectives. So uh, let's just dive into here. And one thing that I'm doing, um, and this is uh, opened up also by Daniel Friedman. So I'm trying to, um, um, you know, if once a year, maybe give a try to hook into the academic community, but there's an opportunity to write uh, or submit maybe uh, a paper uh, to a journal of mind and consciousness. Um, and they're having a special issue on structuralism and consciousness. <clears throat> so this is a very structural theory. So that would be nice to try. Can I present this theory? The basis of my understanding of consciousness is that there's these states of mind. They're given by divisions of everything. There's eight different possible states. They make a cycle, eight cycle, and that there's um, Consciousness is adding three perspectives. So it's kind of like combining the unconscious and the conscious, plus one and plus two. So how would I um, write that up? Well, I'm trying to say, I'm going to write it about the three minds. So instead of talking about these three operations, well, basically I'm going to say there's these three minds and where, why would I have that theory? You know, what is that evidence for? Uh, where is that the evidence? And then um, these mental states. And so one thing that's very nice, because Daniel Friedman, he's a PhD in biology, postdoc, um, worked with uh, red harvester ants. He uh, co-authored a paper suggesting to say, look, if you have a theory of consciousness, why don't you test it out on an ant colony? What would it tell you about ant colonies? Now, it turns out, so you see, if I just wrote about my own theory, it's very likely they would just throw it in the trash can. But if I'm participating in the academic um, discourse, this is a very nice way to do that, to say, okay, here's this challenge. I will show what my theory would say about an ant colony. And so um, one of the, um, what, the way I can approach that is, first of all, I can do a cheat sheet on epistemology of an ant colony. And his advisor, Deborah Gordon, uh, wrote a book that I can um, acquire and uh, study. And I think I've done it maybe 10 or so times, you know, take that way of how ant colonies think and, sh you know, how do they figure things out uh, to map it out? I, I expect I would get 24 different ways. So I've started to actually do that. Uh, um, but um, and then among those 24 ways, there'll be like four that will kind of be revealing the conscious. There'll be four that be the unconscious. So, for example, it may be that um, the pheromone paths that... Um, uh, ants leave that whole maybe like their conceptual language maybe that's like their conscious you see but then they also have genetic um, dispositions uh, for the whole ant colony which is another and so now the consciousness would let's say be mediating those two and then maybe that can tell me like what these three minds are and then how they come together so let's look at more examples just uh, for me this came um, this idea of the three minds came from what all, you know, Thomas knows about, but this division of everything into seven parts, like a logical square, you basically get two points of view. Uh, in logic, you can look at things in terms of what you know or what's true, 
or like what you don't know or what's false. You basically can state everything two ways, uh, just, you know, it's either true or it's not false, let's say, uh, in classical um, Boolean, let's say, logic. So, but in there's a similar structure uh, for in this uh, wondrous wisdom for setting up a logical system, but it, it shows a dialogue between a mind that knows and a mind that does not know. Um, and so that fits very nicely with um, what um, Kahneman and Tversky, uh, psychologists, and in common won the Nobel Prize. I think Tversky had already passed away, but um, uh, in economics uh, for this psychological um, experiments, maybe they did 100 experiments, distinguishing cognitive biases. So we have a fast mind that just kicks in very fast, but you know, it has some strange biases. And then we have a slower mind. And, and traditionally, people would talk about the unconscious versus the conscious, but because those are so, uh, the terms are just so loaded and confusing and unclear, they just said, you know, in our experience, we're going to call one system one and system two. I just go back to the normal uh, everyday terms. Um, so we have that. Now, that also comes up, like, let's say, in pre-conscious processing and conscious processing. So, like, when you uh, do neuro neurological studies, you'll see that certain parts of the brain are lighting up in the first 300 milliseconds, and they might be all scattered. And then, but then after that, uh, you know, this is with regard to some event happening. After that, um, from 300, let's say, to 600 milliseconds, there's a second mind kicking in that's, like, the conscious, so you start to feel deliberate. So certain things are decided even within the first 300 milliseconds, or maybe not decided, they're just suggested. Then in the second 300 milliseconds, there's somebody that you know accepts or vetoes, whatever. So what my theory is suggesting, it's suggesting, you know, and there's a little bit of evidence from the talks I've heard. Typically, there's a waiting period from 300 to 600. So my theory is suggesting that there's a third mind that's acting like a break and it's saying, don't, 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 don't rush, you know, to, and my th basically image is that there's one mind that is the advocate or champion for what it knows, let's say, based on, let's say, 100 billion neural neurons in a network. But there's a second mind that's been developed um, to provide some integrity by restating everything, uh, well, in order to make predictions and model things based on what we don't know, provide resources, um, you know, uh, to model what we don't know in terms of a conceptual language that could be more rigorously um, checked. So with chat GPT, we see an example that humans have been able to invent a mind of the first kind. You know, it just knows, right? But if you ask it how to play, you know, if you, to teach you, you know, good chess strategies, it turns out it's not able to do something like that. It's just kind of like in this hallucinogenic mode. It may think it can, but it can't. So to do logical kind of like... Um, planning and thinking and conceiving, you, you need a language that's more uh, strict. And so then there's a third mind, I'm claiming, that kind of like balances the two. And when they're saying the right, the same thing, then you connect them together. And typically, the first mind is saying the existing models, are, they, if they feel wrong, is giving emotional feedback. So the unconscious is speaking emotionally. The cognitive, uh, I mean, the conscious part is kind of remaking its models. Um, and then it wants to impose them back, the new models, but the consciousness is telling it, wait, 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 you know, so many hundred milliseconds, and then I'll let you freeze it back. So that would be like, I understand the three minds. And so if you look at the traditional uh, stereotypes of the right hemisphere, left hemisphere, this is based on early uh, studies of pathology, you know, like if people have a left brain um, or right brain damaged, you know, what's the resulting uh, consequences? It turned out that um, more recently, you know, people have been studying, um, you know, with better neurological access, what's going on. Just there are so many implementations in the human brain. There's not a unique implementation for really anything. You know, there's all kinds of workarounds and just uh, idiosyncrasies in particular human brains. But here again uh, is something where like my perspective is opening up a possibility of thinking differently, saying, hey, um, don't just focus on material implementation. I'm coming from user requirements. The user requirements based on all this wondrous wisdom are saying you need two minds. You need a mind that knows, you need a mind that does not know. From an evolutionary point of view, it makes sense to have um, two minds, one dedicating resources one way, one dedicating resources towards you know, the, the unknown case. 
and then um taking those uh and then um uh, oh so from a resource requirement point of view to say hey it makes sense to have two hemispheres to kind of like segregate the mind now when you actually you know implement okay it'll be whatever it is but there's an evolutionary pressure possibly to have a whole world so in in parallel to the material implementation there can be a whole world of uh, user requirements that are evolving and so materialists would never see that world but i'm claiming i i, I think we should collect evidence for that world so um that gives you this dialogue and i think in society similar stereotypes of you know about this left brain and in, uh, left brain would right brain is the left hand that would be considered the intuitive thinking and then the right brain is the the left brain is the right hand that would be considered irrational so this distinction between intuitive and rational i think in many cultures um those are traditional stereotypes for women and men uh, and of course we're much more complicated than that uh, but the idea is that in society, there's need to have sometimes the intuitive side of the argument, the rational side of the argument, and to have this com com, you know, ability. And men and women can do both, but people champion one or the other as needed. In Chinese, I think yin and yang, I think, is a similar type of distinction. Uh, we studied uh, with uh, Aslam Kakar in our sociology study group, uh, tacit and explicit. Pierce, firstness, secondness, thirdness is an example. If you look at Plato's Republic, the subjects, warriors, rulers, uh, you look at Hegel thesis, antithesis, synthesis, uh, there's this whole distinction between irrational and rational. So, uh, and even in mathematics, um, if you look at um, O infinity, which is what but periodicity operates on, there's these two worlds. Um, uh, there's this world of um, O infinity as the orthogonal group stacked up in infinitely many dimensions. Uh, uh, as they as they increase, but um, the point being that um, uh, when you have a isometry on O infinity, you can either be um, uh, you can either be rotating or you could be reflecting and rotating. So you get these two branches. So it's kind of curious that this reflection could be something like this subconscious. So any thoughts on this, Thomas? Uh, I think the last pieces are too vaguely connected that I could follow mm -hmm. you. I don't know if you presented them, but I don't see the connection between O, N, when N goes to infinity, and what is really with... That's, yeah, that's speculative. Mind. It's, not, it's, it's not necessary, right. But how about the rest? I might not know enough about all the specific things, but... They seem like one can try to think that way. If it's then nice and helpful, then why not? So that's on the other uh, hand, I don't see a necessary part in all the in all these specific examples that they lead to your frameworks or that your frameworks are expressed in them. I think it's not on a mathematical proof or a mathematical connection. Yes, and so uh, this three minds, um, it's something actually rather new for me, um, but it connects nicely with a lot of psychology and uh, neurology and whatever. So I think it's kind of like an interface. Uh, it's not really key to the, so I, that's why I write it's part of the context. It's not really key to the documentation of the cognitive frameworks as such or to the theory but it is um, nicely kind of fitting in with what people observe. So it's something possible to talk about. And I think that's um, um, so like in that paper, I would talk about that. Um, but and there's another angle on that um, with regard, maybe this is with regard to culture. Um, and this came up with uh, interacting with Kirby and also other people in Math for Wisdom. But um, this difference between deep and shallow. I often stress independent thinking as the basis for this culture, but sometimes um, it may just be really about deep thinking. And I've probably avoided that just as an egalitarian, you know, don't want to say like, oh, I'm deep and you're not deep or whatever. But in a certain sense, I am deep. And the question is, what makes me deep? And so um, it's not always the thinking that needs to be deep, sometimes the interacting. So um, 
uh, I have relationships with people who were kind of interested in what I was doing, but um, did not want to engage me on a level of what we really care about. So our interaction was shallow. And so we re we really couldn't connect. And I think that's one of the things I treasure about your interaction with me and vice versa is that like we can pray together, uh, we can talk together, you know, I can share about personal growth with you. Uh, and so I, that's a very deep interaction. That's a great privilege. Um, uh, and so uh, that's deep interaction, not just kind of shallow. Um, uh, and I guess I write here like, Deep is where we're trying to connect on a level of our inner depths, not just our outer worlds, so to speak, or, or opinions, let's say. Um, but what, you know, what we're actually finding. Uh, so, and thinking can be deeper shallow. And the way I would characterize thinking, uh, or the, the idea that I find um, helpful is in those three minds, it seems to be deep thinking when the consciousness unplugs the other two minds so when the consciousness says hey let's forget about my personal experiences right now so i'm going to shut down my unconscious and i'm going to forget about my personal language uh the, the the you know how i think words mean or whatever and i'll try to think without words and i'll try to think without experiences i'll just try to think what's left and what's left is the machinery that kind of connects those two minds let's say that allows for different correspondences but it's very it's like a void. It's very abstract. It's very difficult. But you are in what's left. And I think it's, uh, for me at least, in terms of trying to imagine God, you know, uh, it's helpful. Um, I guess that's the kind of God I end up with. It's very abstract. So that kind of thinking I find deep. Whereas just focusing on personal experiences, focusing on um, personal uh, language or personal expression, it's shallow. And I think um, like with Kirby, I tried to say, hey, but I think like one of the things that Kirby does, for example, and I think that compensates, um, so in, in a certain sense, he might be shallow in that regard, but he's very broad. So like if you're looking at all of life and in all directions, etc., it just makes you deep, uh, even without wanting to be deep. <laughs> it just makes you deep uh, because you are having to grapple with all the contradictions, all the possibilities and everything. It kind of uh, makes makes you possibly reflect. I don't know. I kind of suspect, though. Does distinction deep and shallow? Does it? How do, does it seem meaningful to you, Thomas? Or I'm. Um, it definitely has a meaning. I'm not sure how to relate with it because, in some way, our talking is always. With words always outside, always using a language. If I try to forget the language, how do I talk? How do I relate? So I can, I think, understand some what you mean with deep and shallow, and it expresses experiences, but this letting go of everything personal is I can think of this in prayer when I try to talk or listen to what God tells but when I try to do it with another person it's like where is the relationship left so I don't have a means to have a deep relationship without relying on what you call now the shallow ex expression. So, well, um, and that's that's certainly the predicament. I think that's the point. Like we, we live in a shallow world, and so how do we? And so, I, and I'm picking on Kirby, but because he's the maybe my friend, <laughs> but um, so and he's he's a trained philosopher. So this idea, like. It's if you want to, you can really just focus on the lang the world, the veneer of worlds. And I'm trying to say, yeah, but there is something maybe belief that the worlds are, are referring, or you can, depending on how you act, you can have actions of the will, actions of the mind, you know, actions of the heart, let's say, that are beneath the words, you know, that gives the words more meaning, let's say. 
additional meaning and Definitely. not just so uh, and we can try to like in math we would say mod out by the words like just ignore the words mm -hmm. uh, and there's it's a difficulty but sometimes see and i think it also helps to be bilingual multilingual you know you're multilingual um certainly bilingual mm -hmm. German and uh, or Austrian, I guess, in, in English, uh, Lithuanian German in English. English. Yes. You also know Lithuanian um, quite well. I'm impressed. So, um, so you know what it means to choose what language you're going to think in, or even refuse to think in a certain language, or you know, at least I certainly do because I was trained to be Lithuanian, and as a child, I forced myself to think in Lithuanian, <laughs> and so that was, um, and so that was a very conscious language, you know, where I choose, and also because I had Lithuanian is a nice language, you can create your own words, um, so I was quite productive, let's say, in that sense, uh, philosophically and in other ways. Anyways, so, um, but to say that's another distinction that is maybe helpful in helping people walk into this way of thinking, because uh, one of the benefits of working with Kirby, Jerry, Daniel, um, uh, Ryan, and others is that I get to, um, I get to see all the hurdles to thinking this way. This is a very strange way to think. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to whip through this Um because you know this, uh, and so the viewers watch some okay. of the videos. There are videos on this. So the divisions of everything you know about, um, there's eight of them. Uh, and then uh, you know that um, kind of like divisions are about perspectives, but then can you take a perspective on a perspective? So if you want to see the division as a whole, well, there is maybe sometimes four, sometimes two ways of doing that. So like, uh, for example, with uh, the foursome, whether, what, how, why, you can think of it from an uh, observer's point of view or from the observed's point of view, which is to say from the idealist point of view, from the materialist point of view. So there's these different uh, uh, ways of looking at things, um, sometimes two and sometimes four. So let's say there's uh, four properties of everything. You know, if you think of everything as the one, so uh, that's for those who know, you know, and if you don't, then watch more videos. But um and then also you can focus on an individual perspective. Uh, that's a perspective on a perspective. Um, and so there's 12 what I call circumstances. I used to call them topologies, uh, but and they're, they're, they're very Kantian, so to speak. Uh, they're similar to Kant's categories, uh, a little bit different. Being, doing, thinking, object, process, subject, necessary, actual, possible, significant, constant. Oh, I'm sorry. And then... Um, And necessary actual oh one all many I've skipped so um basically these are the four conceptions of the three sum I used to call them representations but because it's a math term I try not to use that one four conceptions of the three sum and then they kind of like pop out you can look at things individually and that's like the vocabulary the imagination backdrops so these are the static structures now uh there's three dynamic languages but um there's something important. I haven't maybe talked to you too much about them, but every so often I think I do bring them up. There are these structures, and there's four basically families of structures that um, express the human intuition. And so um, they basically have seven slash eight points of view. And one way um, to think about how they arise um, or what makes them distinct but is it to think about God? So I think of this God as God who goes beyond himself um, into himself. And the, the logic being that, let's say, God is investigating, uh, is God necessary? So God oh, says, okay, let's see if I was not, what would happen? So God has to remove himself. But where does he go? So he goes, he doesn't even have a self in the beginning. So then he kind of creates himself by removing himself and goes into himself because that's the only place he could go. Something strange like that. So that's transcendence is the word uh, we would, would use. Uh, but so the God transcends himself um, and thereby creates himself or herself um, as the whatever your preferred gender for God is. And then um, God um, wishes for... Um, Okay, so this is kind of like wishing. And if you look at that process in the from the beginning and then the middle and the end, there's like four stages that you can talk about. There's these four scopes, uh, nothing, something, anything, everything, in which it's expanding out uh, what's happening. Uh, let's say the the God's self, let's say, is expanding, that God's entering into, that, which is kind of like the lack of where, where God is not. So let's think about that. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting.
I just make a note, note to self because uh, mm -hmm. God's going into himself. So that means he's is not in the other place. So if, if, so then that's important. That, that's important maybe later on uh, in the compliment. So God wishes for nothing, is self-sufficient, is wishes for something, is certain, wishes for anything, is calm, wishes for everything, is loving. But we humans, um, when we arise, uh, we're not like that. We have what I could say is reservations. In Lithuania, would be simply not wishes. And so God wishes for nothing is self-sufficient, but we're not self-sufficient. We have needs, uh, bodies with needs. Uh, so there's a structure for that, and there's operating principles to address that. So I'll show one structure like that. There's uh, We have minds. Uh, God is certain, but we're not certain. We have doubts. Uh, we have minds with those doubts and counter questions to address them. Uh, God wishes for anything is calm, but we have hearts that are not calm, but have expectations and emotional responses that come from that and ways of getting things done that uh, address that too. And then God wishes for everything is loving, but we don't wish for loving. We kind of want to have some control. Um, uh, so we have a we tend to integrate around a value, a deepest value. And so in a, in a certain sense, having a value is kind of like not being loving everywhere, but kind of like being you know, restricting that whole question to a particular point, let's say, that we're going to deal with, which may be quite contradictory in us. So just I'll just show those structures maybe quickly, because um, in a certain sense, this is half of the essence of the big picture. This is what the human experiences. So I'll, I'll just run through. I mean, I'll show these, but I'll just show you what I'm going through is there's different types of structures, and they all tend to have seven slash eight uh, perspectives. If you include the God's perspective, then you'll have eight, but sometimes you could just uh, skip that. You'll have seven. So there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example. So this is, let's say, the body's needs and operating principles. And so you have a need for survival. Um, and then what I've noticed or what I claim or what, what I kind of, how I imagine things, let's say, but maybe, I hope this is not just me, but we'll see. Uh, and these are almost pre-mathematical. But if you, when you have a need to survive, you cling to what you have but then you have a need for security, which means uh, want to be able to survive tomorrow. So then you get more than what you need so that tomorrow you could cling to what you have. Okay. And then you want to maybe allow others to, to survive. So they need to cling to what they have. So you don't want to rock the boat. So this need for acceptance or social need, um, you avoid extremes so that they you don't make it hard for them to cling to what they have. And then this is kind of like needs for the body, but um, the part of the body, let's say, that organizes, you know, the brain or like the psyche, you could say, also has needs. And so it has its own issue of survival, let's say. So the psyche uh, wants self-esteem. So I kind of say that's an analogy, like uh, that the psyche needs self-esteem to, quote unquote, survive. That's how it, at least it feels. And every time you choose the good over the bad, the psyche feels that, oh, it has a value meaning or, you know, it's 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 um, acknowledged. So every time it makes a, it can make a decision. And so you want to be able to do that uh, tomorrow, not just uh, today. So you choose the better over the worst. That's the need for opportunity for freedom. And then you want to allow others uh, to have self-esteem. And so that's the need for self-fulfillment, self-actualization, let's say, uh, self-meaning. And so then you strive for the best, You're kind of like extreme. Like here's where if you're extreme, it makes it easier for other people to choose. So uh, whether you're good or bad or whatever it is. So those are the needs. I understand those are the ways we respond to them. They're quite mechanical. But then the very important thing, and um, this is where scripture uh, becomes relevant, is that it shows, oh, there are two additional ways that we can operate that don't come out of any need. So instead of First of all, so we may have needs, but we can ignore them. And we ignore them by taking up the needs of another. So that's one way to do it. And the other can have all So, and you can be altruistic, for example, and it's just not clear, like it's not observable. Like maybe you're altruistic because that's normal. And so you don't want to, you want to avoid extremes. You're doing what's normal. Or maybe you're doing it uh, uh, for self-esteem, or maybe you're doing it... Um, for freedom or for self-fulfillment or for security, you know, they get points to go to heaven or something like that, or for survival. It's not clear. Are you doing it for those reasons or are you simply doing it because you're taking up the need of another? You know, you're just not doing it for any of those reasons. You're just doing it uh, to, to, to worry about another. So it's kind of invisible. And then the other one is that you may have, 
you can just simply not have needs. So when Jesus says, be perfect, like your heavenly father is perfect, you know, uh, sends his sunlight on the good and the bad, sends his rain on the good and bad, basically be unconditional, I guess is what it would mean. So you don't have to have needs. And I think of my uh, grandmother, uh, she passed away, but uh, Maria Kapatsinskas, uh, she passed away, but she would uh, just watch uh, Oprah or opera, as she called her, and just uh, relax after after doing her chores and um, just seemed everything's perfect. Why not just be perfect like that? So um, that's a possibility. Um, and so then, um, and this became apparent studying, for example, the Beatitudes, which I'll come to later, uh, that there's these different uh, possibilities. Uh, but they come up uh, in the Gospel of John. There's these I am statements. And what they seem to say is that uh, the I am statements um, are eight expressions Jesus talked about himself. So like, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I won't go through this in detail. I'll be making a, maybe an hour-long video about this. But the idea is that I am the resurrection and the life. He's kind of appealing to this need for survival, but saying like, if you're going to cling to what you have, but don't cling to your, you, you can choose. Are you going to cling to yourself? Or are you going to cling to God? See, if you cling to God, then you will be resurrected and alive in that sense. And I think it's because of the glory of God. Like, that's the logic. I think I figured these out, like, for each case. But uh, the glory of God, intent of God, example of God, love of God, works of God, command of God, will of God, let's say. All these things, there's all these logics that would say, look, if you choose God over yourself, it's just going to be a consequential choice. So, um, and you have that choice. And this frame, this whole framework kind of sets that up. Like, it's kind of like the whole point of having bodies with needs and principles so addressing these needs and these extra options is that then you're set up with this choice between two reference frames. Are you going to have yourself or are you going to have God? Any thoughts on this, Thomas? I think it's nice. The connection to the Bible, I would also ask theologians, do they mean the same or is mm -hmm. there other additional meaning in it but to some extent it seems consistent sensible probably helpful so yeah i think it's good yeah it's so this is actually so these four structures i'm showing now are the ones that are actually helpful in wondrous wisdom because what they do is they say look uh, they teach us how to live basically they say look there's all this mechanical aspect of life but there's two ways to get around that. One is you can have lots of needs. Just worry about somebody else's needs. <laughs> That's number one, escape. Number two is like, look, you may not have needs. You may be perfect, you know, at times, let's say, at moments or whatever. Or maybe somebody else may be perfect. They, they don't, don't have needs. Like, just accept that that's a possibility, that that's godly, uh, that that's as being in God with God or somehow... And then, of course, like we just saying, those two reference frames to say, and even with those choices, those needs, you have... Uh, it's very kind. So, so now, another useful one was this um, minds, doubts, and counter questions. So, like I said, God wishes for something certain, but we have minds with doubts. And um, back um, in 1990, maybe, I think it was six, um, I was uh, organizing goodwill exercises with friends in Chicago and uh, to deal with situations where we're riled um, and we believe one thing in the well, we think we want to follow the truth of the heart, but we're running into problems with that. It riles us, and we don't know what to do. Um, so this co conflict between the truth of the heart and the truth of the world. And the main uh, conclusion, it turned out to be that the person who's riled is always wrong about that. So that was, uh, I'll be able to maybe uh, talk more about that at some point. But um, there was uh, Bob Weinberger was one of the participants. He said, how do we know you're not going to brainwash us, you know, Andres? Uh, so I said, well, why don't we come up with ways to de-brainwash ourselves? So I made a list. This is a typical investigation I would do. I made a list of about like 30 instances where um, I uh, de-brainwashed myself. Uh, and I've made a video about one of them. And that is uh, this question like, um, how do I know, you know, how do you know you're not a robot? So I was in maybe seventh or eighth grade and Mr. Melton at Calder Junior High School asked that question. And so I said, well, 
the way to deal with that kind of doubt is with a counter question. Would it make any difference? So it turns out, and then it doesn't answer the question, but it says, look, uh, you tell me what a robot is, right? Like maybe I am a robot. You know, do robots bleed? Do robots fall in love? Do robots believe in God? Let's say maybe I am, but or or maybe I'm not. But um, but uh, I'll throw it back at you. And so it lets you uh, reorient your mind without having to um, uh, depend on any kind of quote unquote facts, anything about, let's say, the world, you know. And so maybe that's one of the ways that my thinking is different than most people is that I'm able to unplug from the world. And so this is what I call intelligence. And so there's seven different ones uh, for different situations. Um, how does it seem to me? What else should I be doing it? Would it make any difference? Is this the way things should be? Am I able to consider the question? Am I doing anything about this? What do I have uh, control over? And then I realized uh, I can systematize them. I can look at it as four levels. And this relates to the foursome. You know, that there's God, um, let's say why, like person in general, person in particular, and the world. And so... Each of these is like looking over the shoulder, uh, one level over the other level. So like um, if a person in particular looks at the world, and it's like, well, how does it seem to me? But if a person in general looks at the world, it would be like, well, looking over like my shoulder, like what else should I be doing? But if that person in general is looking at a person in particular situation, it could be, well, would it make any difference? And so on, like, or God could be looking at these different situations. That's how you get these counter questions. And so you can see why there could be seven of them that apparently you can't have them on the same level. Um, God does not have a situation according to this, and the world does not have a uh, perspective. And so you end up with seven possibilities. And so they're all cares. And there seems to be an eighth one, though. There's always like seven slash eight. Like, what do I truly want? And so you can ask that without any doubt. You can just ask, like, what do I truly want? And so God's certain. So it just happens. But we can do that, too. We can say, what do I truly want? Maybe that's a little bit like what Jesus said, like what you believe is what happens. Or maybe what you truly want is what happens. It might be. Or I don't know. I just don't know. That's a tough one, what he said. So, but then this is intelligence. And so this is a model for intelligence is the ability to let go of all your facts and reorient yourself, like recalibrate um, yourself in terms of what is this going to be about. But uh, uh, then you can look at these um, with regard to the truth of the heart or the truth of the world. So one example would be like, is this the way things should be? You know, let's say God is looking at the world. Uh, you know, let's say, and I'm an, I'm an alcoholic uh, or no, I'm not an alcoholic, but I, but I, I let's say I um, throw up every Monday morning. <laughs> the question is like, is this the way things should be? You know, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't, but it's a question. And so I can, the truth of the heart will answer that one way. The truth of the world seems to answer it the other way. And I think the pattern is, and this is a, maybe a delicate, careful thing to be careful about, but is this the way things should be? The heart's approach is to say, um, it is, Oh, it is wrong because, oh, this is like, is this truly wrong? Is this the way things should be? That's the counter question. The doubt, is this truly wrong? Is this the way things should be? Uh, and then um, the issue is that uh, the heart will say it's wrong. That's the way it should be. Uh, whereas the um, world would say it's wrong. It's not the way things should be. So the world would say, I should not be throwing up, you know, um, but the heart might say, look, I need to be throwing up because it's not about drinking. It's about like there's something wrong in my life and I need to see that I need to be that. Or like I think of I think the example that helped me um, see this is like Jesus on the cross. Like that's wrong that Jesus was crucified. But the idea is that it is the way things should be. It's it's kind of like it's crucial, like for everything to go like. And so Jesus went into that understanding that that it just has to be that way uh it should be that way because uh, it, people but um but but whereas like in the world it's like oh it shouldn't be that way but to realize like so in that again this motto of mine or this conclusion of mine that uh, god does not have to be good like for us to grow it's just going to have to be that there's different things are not going to be the way we want or the way they, they their way that are good or the way that are so that, again, is this distinction between the, the truth of the heart, which would be like the, the godly type of way of looking at things, which is kind of devoid of experience, the childish way of looking at things, and the truth of the world, which would be based on experience, you know, what we would assume. I don't know if that distinction is clear, but what, what's your thoughts on here at this point, Thomas? 
it's hard to tell what the heart would do, but I think the idea of having this way of reflecting on yourself is that correct or not, and being in the thinking process without having judgments before is probably really, really helpful. So in, I in guess the, this is something mm -hmm. that we can take for us and try to implement if we are not sure about something. So. And so this is like super practically helpful. Uh, and it's not, of course, like it's maybe we could say tentative, you know, it certainly needs a community of practice people to kind of like work, but it's something that really should be, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a helpful suggestion. It has again, uh, it ends again in that choice, you know, that's wisdom. So wisdom would be understanding like what is the right way to, you know, approach this or answer this like this is a picture of intelligence but wisdom is one step beyond that when you choose between the godly way of thinking and the, the not godly way of thinking here um this was happening in parallel kind of like these first three and these second three um they were in parallel uh, but here you can see there's a channel the connecting the the perspective and situation. So there's a single channel. Then I think we'll have like a double channel and a triple channel. Kind of reminds me of chemistry, like you have a the uh, one single bond, double bond, triple bond, but um, something like that. Um, uh, that's just a random thought. Um, and also um, here, it's very important that one of them happens to actually go up to a. So it's very interesting. Like person in particular can look at the person general's point of view. So like, am I truly anxious? Well, am I doing anything about this? You see? So like, maybe I have a relationship with a friend and I don't know, like, you know, what's going on? Like, you know, should I be worried? Well, am I doing anything about this? Yes or no? Like, maybe I did. Maybe I sent them a present. You did something. You did something kind. Don't worry about it. Or maybe I could, you know, do something. So um, there's this. Now, in terms of the uh, heart uh, and the... Um, uh, God wishes for anything is calm, but we're not calm. We have all kinds of emotions. We have we, they're coming from our expectations. I've made some videos about that. Uh, oh, but first I want to say this structure of the mind, the cognitive one. So this is just purely cognitive. This really didn't have anything to do with emotions, but it comes up in nonviolence. I made a film about um, Ukraine uh, being uh, having peace in Russia and Ukraine, the ways of engaging gangs. I've had a lot of practice with that. I uh, worked with youth and like why they change their mind. I got a similar structure, the types of prayer, like where, you know, um, God and even Sean Carroll has a video where he talks about the strangeness of God, that sometimes God fates, but sometimes God like manages, reacts, sometimes God inspires, you see. And then similarly, like uh, in prayer, you see, sometimes I submit, sometimes I inform, sometimes I suggest. So you get these seven combinations of um, prayer for guidance, confession, worship, challenge, praise, petition, help, you know, depending on those relationships. But the most important one is like the seventh and eighth are most important, um, is where um, um, God inspires, but I suggest. I said, hey, okay, you're inspiring, but could you do this? It's a prayer for uh, petition, interjection, like intercession, I think, like prayer to say, look, God, why don't you do this for this person or 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 for me or for whatever, like for the world? And so that's a strange relationship with God, but that seems to be the one that, uh, that's the one that Jesus really emphasized. There's There should be an eighth one here, and it may be the prayer of thanks, you know, just this appreciation of God, you know, just appreciation, maybe this kind of like where it's not anything to do with uh with a relationship with God. It's just, I don't know. Edward de Bono's thinking hats have this also type of thing. Um, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. Uh, and Jesus's antithesis on the Sermon on the Mount. So like, if you read the first um, part of the Sermon on the Mount, he goes through the different uh, commands and they're basically things like, you know, would it make any difference, you know, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do even the tax collectors do the same? So you should love your enemy. So he's basically like, would it make any difference uh, if you didn't love your enemy? So now um, I wanted to move on to this with the heart's expectation, emotional responses. And I've talked about uh, these uh, where um, uh, you you wish, you mean you expect something and then maybe it, um, maybe it happens or maybe the opposite happens, but um, it doesn't. Uh, but that could be something not so important to you on the outside or it could be something um, very important to you, like 
on the inside, the difference between like, you know, theory and practice, so to speak. Or there could be things that happen uh, that you just refuse to have expectations about. So if they're on the outside, you'll be frightened. If they're on the inside, you'll be disgusted. Uh, you start off it with peace before you have an expectation. And during, while you're waiting, you know, you'll be in suspense. So there's these emotional responses. Um, there's ways of getting things done um, that kind of like are also like maybe a secondary response. Um, so if you're, and I worked this out with my friend Joe Damel. He was a community organizer in Market Park, Chicago, uh, in the Southwest, Southwest uh, Community Site Community Center. Um, but so like if you're frightened, you should confront but if you're uh, sad, you should retreat. You should renew. If you're content, you should uh, delegate. If you're excited, you should initiate. If you're surprised, you should articulate. If you're uh, disgusted, make yourself heard. If you're in suspense, then you just use sheer will. And if you're in peace, then respond. And so uh, this is maybe debatable, but this is very practical in terms of like uh, how as a community organizer to understand what you should be doing in different situations. So um, to practice this. And these are all like bigger than the mind can handle. You know, you can't uh, introspect seven, eight things all at once. Um, but it's like a room. It's like a house with seven rooms um, where you know all the rooms, um, but you can't see them all at once. And so there's this and this. And maybe I'll just there's Jesus has ways he showed goodwill uh, appealing to people or not. And there's dimensions of emotions. And then um, I'll just dash this off. But like there's a structure kind of like the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, where um, you take a stand, follow through, reflect. Uh, okay. So there's this uh, in terms of the will. Uh, and so in terms of the heart, I don't know. Um, there should be a pair of connections here, but I haven't ever figured it out. You know, like one of the big mysteries is how to have all these four eightfold structures, uh, which are like the human intuition. They're kind of like modeling the human situation, so to speak, um, uh, from a, from a like what we're, you know, how we can look at things. Um, uh, these are like the very important frames. Uh, uh, and so I don't really quite know how to... Um, Think of that as a double double bond, so to speak. But let's move on to this triple bond thing. Everything was everything. I'll look at the Our Father is a prayer that I kind of know well. And basically the idea is that if you look at this, it has eight lines, um, the Lord's Prayer. And the first four lines and the second four lines are kind of like focused in different uh, things. And so the way I think about it, like I'm praying to God who loves me more than I loved myself, um, you know, wants me to be alive and supportive and responsive more than I could possibly be, like a parent with regard to a child. So then if I have a God like that, I'd rather God think than I think. I'd rather God be than I be. I'd rather God do than I do. So things like, you know, if I will be done on earth as in heaven, is that kind of mindset? Like if we're in touch, you decide. But a lot of times we're not in touch. That's very normal. And so... um then I need to be uh, responsible for myself directly with this three cycle. I take a stand, follow through, reflect. And so then I ask God, like, watch over me. So like, give me my daily bread or give us this daily bread so that I could uh, follow through on my stands. I could, you know, do what I intend. And then um, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Like, let me look at what I'm doing. You know, if you don't forget me, it's very difficult for me to look at what I'm doing. But if you forgive me, I will look at what I'm doing. I'll be able to do that. And then don't lead us astray. Lead us not into temptation. But, you know, I want to think freely. And then I want to choose based on that. Now, if I'm being tempted in very bad ways, I'm. it's just not going to work. I can't make my own choice. So let me be in a situation where I can, based on thinking freely, I can make the, you know, a, a, a appropriate choice. And you just deliver us from evil. It's kind of like seeing a look like you don't have to be the loving father, perfect parent or whatever. Just get us out of here. Or just save us or just whatever. Like, and just be a good enough God. Right. You know, just watch over us, please. You know, uh, begging, begging you. So uh, maybe I am. Um, but this type of structure where you have on the one hand. And so when I pray this, like it kind of in this way, like trying to make it all resonate. It's a flickering between like, well, if I'm in touch with God then we'll let God make all these decisions. But then God typically says, well, you try, you know, you be in my place and, and think what to do. Whereas when I'm on my own, it's like a lot of times I reach back, I say, hey, God, I need your help. 
you know, so there's this back and forth. Am I in touch with God? Am I not? There's this flickering between these two points of view. And it's happening across these three different independent channels. And so then you get permutations. Like, so if it's thinking, being, doing here, there's another one, uh, which is in St. Peter's letter. He goes from faith to love, but it's about doing, thinking, being. There's another one uh, from the Beatitudes. It's about being, doing, thinking. Um, but uh, Buddha's Eightfold Way also has this. There's other structures. Uh, and th that's why I call it the Eightfold Way. I think I, I first noticed basically this in Buddha's Eightfold Way, and then I realized that in Christianity it also appears. So um, any thoughts on this, Thomas, so far? I think it's hard for me to adopt it, but mm -hmm. I don't see anything wrong. It's a way of structuring what our father has. And I wouldn't restrict others to say, oh, you have to do the same, but it might mm -hmm. be helpful to try it out. It's And, and so the, and then it's you know the 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 Lord's mm -hmm. prayer is one thing, and then but the idea is that is there a structure like this? Does it have a reality? You know, is it is it at play? You know, so that's the that's the that's a separate question, and so that's what I'm uh, uh, mm -hmm. working on. So there's this personal experience, and you know that's the that's the issue. Um, and so these are the four things. In each case, they do seem to set things up like with they deal with practical human reservations, like. God is wishing. We don't want to wish. You know, we're holding back. But how do we overcome that? And then how, in overcoming that, how do we choose God over ourself? And so there's like a zero channel way based just on parallelism, a one channel, two channel, three channel way. And I think um, like the eight sum is contradictory. It collapses. It's division of anything collapses. But I think like in four different spokes, scopes, this is kind of like what it would be looking like if it did not collapse. It's like on the verge of collapse, let's say, right? So something that would just collapse of its own, That's that seems to be a structural way I'm thinking about. And so I'm going to try to relate these to the 24-fold sciences. So mm -hmm. those uh, four um, reservations, as I call them, are perhaps mm -hmm. the most useful thing about the wondrous wisdom, the thing that really uh, could be. Uh, and so that's why, like, for nonviolence, um, nonviolent engagement, uh, that's... Uh, Mm -hmm. seems would be nice to apply things like that um mm -hmm. that then um there's three languages that would be exciting to um uh figure out uh, i've figured out i think one of them quite well narration so just like there are those three minds um the three languages seem to accord with them um and based on actually based on that uh eightfold way and the three permutations Back in graduate school, I kind of uh, realized that, uh, oh, these, I think, would be frameworks for languages. There should be three languages. There should be a language for how thing events happen, which I call narration, a language for how meaning arises, um, I call verbalization, and a language for um, how... Um, things come to matter, and that would be argumentation. And so, of course, I'm doing this in Lithuanian, typically, but... Um, what does it mean these... things come to matter? Well, something didn't matter, but then, then it did matter. Right? Like, so what, you know, how did that happen? Like, how is okay. it that something, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Now, now it makes more sense. So it's not that it comes to be matter to... No, not, I'm talking matter, to a physicist, but... so I have to be careful how I use the word matter. Maybe, but it's also about my understanding and... Right. I mean, the matter depends now also on a person for whom it matters. Exactly. So, and in general, all of this is with regard to a person. So the idea is mm -hmm. that each person has the same machinery, but they're in their own life. So, mm -hmm. um, and so with narration, like I can, uh, I went then to Lithuania and that was my goal. And I was successful uh, in coming up with a theory of narration using as data Lithuanian folk tales. I had a book uh, of tales collected by uh, Lithuania's patriarch, uh, Jonas Basanavičius. Uh, very straightforward tales. Um, and um, they um, 
when I studied them, I had to break them up according to somebody interpreting them, which was basically me. But like, you know, where do they see the tension uh, being increased and then relaxed? So you break them up into units of tension. There's a whole uh, there's a whole thing. I'll, maybe I'll show that. But first, before I do that, I want to. Um, so I got that language figured out uh, how it works. Uh, but the other two, I never could. And so I'm trying to come back to it again. And I have a lot to think about that before I go there. The key thing I want to talk about today, really, for the big picture, and it kind of relates to this equation of life, but here again, um, this interpretation of God's investigation and human's investigation. So the human, um, those four frameworks, uh, reservations uh, that I just introduced, uh, they... Um, they um, relate to these four investigations by a human. So like how to live eternal life, I think that's related to those needs and the operating principles and choosing to live in terms of God instead of in terms of yourself. How to live by wisdom, that would be those counter questions and how to apply them with the truth of the heart instead of the truth of the world. How to live by goodwill, that's how like Jesus speaks to the goodwill, from the goodwill with regard to different emotional situations and how to live by God's will. That's what the type of Eightfold Way, for example, with Lord's Prayers explain, like, you know, there's God's will, there's our will. How do we align with that? So those four questions and these four questions, um, I don't really remember exactly where they came from, but I have thousands of questions I write down and I kind of organize them and I look at them and I see patterns. And those are the patterns that my questions kind of fall into. And these seem just very practical. Um, so... What I want to do now is uh, these are eightfold structures. So now there's these 24 fold structures, which are even bigger. Uh, and uh, they seem to be like sciences and they seem to be related to God's investigation. So I want to run through those. And I've shown you basically those. Those will be right here. I just want to point to one. Well, maybe I'll just go through a couple of them. So one is God's dance. So the idea that uh, just when you have God, all, as the zeroth person, let's say. But there's this whole mental algebra you can I can do imagining God, um, where there's a God who understands, who is asking this question, am I necessary? He pulls away and then goes in beyond themselves, into themselves. And so then they appear, I guess. Maybe that's how it works. Uh, there's a Godling, like Jesus would be an example, but like a a, a, a human, a fool, like the, being the, the smallest vessel that God could possibly <laughs> Uh, be in. And so this there's Godling who comes to understand, who comes to figure out, hey, you know, uh, you're God, or, you know, hey, I'm God, but but maybe more importantly, hey, you're God. And then how do they know they're the same God? It's because there's a God, the lens, that says, look, that tiny little God that appeared is equally, well, it understands the same thing as the big giant God who uh, set all this up in the first place. They're equally important, so to speak, in a sense, like this giant lens kind of like makes them all fit. So those are three ways of, um, so the God, which is understood by both. So the God who understands, the God who kind of understands. There's this whole dance, and then you get structures from each of those uh, three points of view. So this one actually is from the I am God's point of view, but you can look at the same story from the Godling's point of view, and then it will look like there's a God who goes beyond himself into himself or herself, and then back. Uh, and so there'll be like eight stages where that can happen. Then looking from the side, there'll be these four levels and there'll be six gaps possibly to be overcome. Uh, so that'll be 10. It's, it turns out to be like the 10 commandments. And then there could be a three cycle of these. So if you add all these up, there's 24. And I've, I've told you about this. You were actually present as I was working through that. But I wanted to show this one. So there's four of these 24 fold sciences, as I call them. Um, or I call them sometimes circulations or flows, uh, but um, they're for the four persons, God, I, you, others. So then God opens up, you know, God goes beyond himself and basically there makes room for this I. Maybe I is like what is in that space that God created before, like let's say Jesus figured out he was God. Maybe he was just I, like we are, right? Like maybe we're in a similar situation, except that, Everything went smoothly for Jesus. I don't know, but but we're in this kind of funky situation where we've been set up in this conditions, but somehow we have this godly spirit. Um, however, that may be. 
um, one of the, th so I'm trying to diagram that. And I've been studying, uh, several years ago, I was studying that quite intensely, looking at uh, meaningful experiences in my life. When I was studying um, improvisational acting, I made like a list of a hundred or more uh, meaningful experiences in my life that I would kind of keep in mind as I was thinking of things to improvise and to act and so on. And then I picked about 30 of them where I intensely documented, well, what was meaningful about that? And the classic example would be like when I was in fourth grade, um, uh, everyone was starting to curse a lot, uh, use curse words. And I thought, well, I should talk like everybody. I shouldn't be, you know, removed, aloof. or So I started using curse words. Uh, and then Lacey Diaz, and everyone was in love with Lacey Diaz. She said, you shouldn't curse. And I go, why not? You curse. Everyone curses. She goes, but it doesn't suit you. And then I thought about that. And, you know, because she said that, and she was so lovely, I thought, oh, I don't have to. So this idea that there was my self that was cursing, but then someone loved me in this nice way, and I could let go of that, and then I could pick up a new self, let's say. So someone with their love was able to nicely influence me to let go of that kind of un unnecessary thing and to grow and to be a new person. So I collected like maybe more than 100 episodes in my life like that. Um, I have a lot of data. So um, and then I looked at different fields structurally, what's happening, and then I got maybe like 29 or so, but possibly there could be like 24 fields or so. But the, what I wanted to focus on is um, this is an old hypothesis I have from long ago, from about the year 2000 or so, in terms of how, like, why do we have eight divisions and six conceptions and 12 circumstances? And it is curious that they are kind of like the numbers associated with a cube or with an octahedron, like a cube has eight corners and six faces and 12 edges. So I've never really managed to work that out. Maybe, maybe that will be meaningful someday or not. But what I did um, realize, kind of like, here, I'm writing, the body has these needs, the mind has doubt, hard expectations, and the will has values. Those are these eightfold, sevenfold structures. And what I noticed was, hmm, if I imagine, if I take these, let's say, doubts and counter questions in particular, the counter questions respond to these doubts. But I imagine a self-sufficient God was taking up these counter questions. That would seem to spark these divisions of everything. Like, so if I thought, like, if, if this type of self-sufficient primordial God said, well, how does it seem to me? Well, it would seem like a one sum. <laughs> but if that God said, well, what else should I be doing? You know, like, you know, like this whole, well, maybe I should go on this quest, you know, am I necessary? Well, that would be kind of like a two sum would kind of open up, you know, what else should, you know, would it make any difference? It seems to function like a three sum. And, you know, what do I have, you know, control over uh, these levels of knowledge for, you know? Uh, am I able to consider the question? So this five-fold space-time structure for decision-making. Uh, is this the way things should be, the sixth and for morality? Uh, um, uh, am I doing anything about this? I guess would be this system for logic, right? But um, that's maybe a stretch for somebody who's... But the way I'm in tune, it just does seem... It has the right feeling, like, oh, that would be a very interesting derivation. So then I did that. And then I kind of realized, like, it did seem very plausible that the way to generate all these structures is you take God at one level, but you have God empathize with the human reservations at another level. So I won't go into all that machinery, but um, it did seem, uh, it, it, it seemed difficult, it seemed stuck. But it, first of all, gave a clue, like, in terms of trying to learn these languages, to get a better understanding of the uh, relevant structures. Because these three languages, uh, what they seem to be doing, like the narration takes you from the six conceptions to the eight divisions. And the other ones, likewise, they take you from one type of family of structure to another. And these are static, but the languages are dynamic. So this is like a super chart, kind of like um, the standard model, so to speak, you know, the hypothetical standard model of how it should all fit together. And so, um, I guess I wanted to show, why did I want to show this? Um, oh, because it's just saying that I think that these four frameworks are going to be important in generating these, I used to call these the primary structures, and then these here are the secondary. Also, the primary ones, like if you, 
if you look back at those eightfold structures, it's kind of like relating to God or kind of like relating to like a you, that there's some you that this is all with regard to. Whereas the things like divisions and conceptions and circumstances, they seem very much kind of like objective, like how it looks from the side. They're not so direct. So um, that is something I wanted to show before I go into, oh, and maybe I have just five minutes now. And so that'll be just enough time just to scoot very quickly through the three languages. So in trying to understand those three languages, uh, there's this whole investigation I'm doing. And I'm, these are relevant, you know, writings and things. But I need to pick a data source. to So like the folktales work for narration. For argumentation, I'm thinking, hey, chess, I know a lot about. Chess is a finite uh, system. Um, Bobby Fisher's 60 Memorable Games. Um, they're memorable like this, you know, to, like how do things come to matter in chess or how do things arise in meaning in chess? So chess is one thing I'll be looking at. Another thing I'll be looking at is um, language learning. So trying to systematize the ways of figuring out in language learning. What are language learners learning? You know, what is it all about? Um, I've looked at examples of irony in Lithuanian purpose. There's a Holocaust. That, so you got to pick a good data source to get your hands dirty with. And I have to do that. And here are some relevant maybe ways of figuring things out that are helpful. Then you have to pick a unit of tension. So in narration, it's like someone creates tension and it goes back. But like uh, it could be um, in pattern languages, there's these patterns um, where that are being solved that have to be optimized, uh, like in architecture, trying to solve architectural problems, like in argumentation. In verbalization, this distinction between the truth of the heart, the truth of the world, uh, getting them confused, causing tension. There probably needs to be a source of tension that has to be dealt with by the language. And then organizing the units of the tension, like there's like networks or trees or sequences um, that in play. And then visualizations pair those. Uh, uh, there's got to be some kind of structural systems to organize that. And so there's, uh, for each, those eightfold ways had three variants. So the Beatitudes was the one that was useful for um it had references to those um, needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it basically said, you know, in the narration, when you look at how a character develops, you'll have that hierarchy of needs uh, in play. So similarly, um, each of those has a hierarchy of its uh, relevant, and it should be in play. And then um, this work I've been doing, oh, you shift from one family to another. I mentioned that, these gradations, I mentioned that, these hierarchies. And then analyzing the data, how it all fits together. I mean, there's a whole thing to do, but I feel I've learned enough in the last couple of decades where I can give it a try again. So that's just to run through this to say, like, this is all um, work to be done that I'll be making videos about as I investigate that. And then maybe just in a couple minutes is enough just to say here, this culture of independent thinkers, I became very real for me when I was organizing independent thinkers uh, in 1998 to 2010 with my online laboratory, Minshu Soldas, asking people about their deepest values in life, their investigatory questions, seeing how they grow as independent thinkers, going through various uh, stages. I encapsulated that in a pattern language of 12 different questions I would ask them. We had various principles like this uh, public domain or this economy of giving it away. So that is all recurring here with uh, wondrous, uh, with Math for Wisdom. So, so far I've been um, talking a lot about the cognitive frameworks uh, that I've accumulated, documented. And in general, they've been giving the human point of view. Uh, so especially those uh, four families um, with seven, eight perspectives, uh, very valuable in terms of human experience. Uh, the three languages, which I skirted through, <laughs> and really I know not enough about uh, really even to present, um, I'll be investigating, uh, but those will are based on those uh, intuitions and uh, in terms of empathizing with those intuitions from various godly perspectives. That should give uh, the languages I'm looking for, um, which and should help to model this experience of life. Um, now I want to talk about the godly perspective, so to speak, and uh, these have come up more recently in the last 10 years or so, maybe starting uh, when I met you around uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
one crucial thing here is actually, maybe I'll um, give some machinery uh, that's important. This is relevant whenever we have a system. Uh, it's this four plus six. So you'll have four levels and six pairs. But actually, even before I do that, I think I want to go to the end again and explain you know, what I'm trying to do. So I'm saying that um, as a human, I think there's four basic questions um, that I'm investigating, uh, which have to do, um, maybe I would even say with this table, maybe I should start here with this table, the equation of life. Uh, and this will maybe also relate to the investigations by God, um, God's, how, how do God and human relate? And I've told you this quite a few times, but mm -hmm. intuitively, the sum of my philosophy, um, and I think it took you time to try to grapple with what I was meaning, and I still grapple with it, but that God does not have to be good. So what I mean by that is that um, uh, God is unconditional. Uh, good is God within conditions. Life is the fact that God is good. So somehow this love beyond and some kind of uh, freedom and slack within are in harmony. And whenever that happens, we have life. But eternal life, uh, eternal growth, eternal learning is understanding, uh, separating those two out so that the original primordial God beyond um, doesn't have to be good. Uh, good is just conditional. Uh, and a lot of that conditional, you know, we're, we're creatures of condition. Uh, but the question is, can we live beyond condition? And so then um, if there's this disconnect, and if we want to be able to grow, if we want to be able to have meaningful choices, uh, we're going to be in an environment where there's just something not right happening all the time. Things that life is unfair. And partly, I mean, um, partly I'm speaking theoretically, but um, mostly this is uh, really what we all observe practically, that uh, uh, life is extremely unfair, usually unfair to other people in ways it's uh, maybe overly fair for us, you know, so we may benefit in tremendous ways uh, when other people don't uh, and vice. Well, that's at least my experience in my life has been mostly like that. I'm, I'm, of course, there are people for whom it would be the other way around, um, but um, certainly not fair and just very complicated. So good things happen, bad things happen just in a very um, just uh, mind boggling way. Um, uh, and I think I came to this uh, I, as a child. I had a very open mind uh, to say, just keep open on these things. Don't make presumptions. But I think I was swayed by my study of the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus is like algebraic thinking the way he revealed himself to his closest and best friend. Uh, the best friend who probably tried to give a picture of how Jesus actually thought. You know, I mean, I'm projecting, but I think that's that's the way I make sense of it. And so just chasing down this algebra of like his father's will and what does all that mean, etc. But I think that was, I'll have to maybe look, go back into that, delve into that, but um, that was the conclusion I drew. So um, I don't know if I'll let you say something about that if you like, maybe you can explain it. I think that you really emphasize now what is the difficulty to understand God doesn't, God is not good because this is, what I heard before, but now you say does good is to understand that does God does not have to be good, so mm -hmm. that you take this experience and what we think as a necessity really apart. I think that this is important and helps others not immediately to stumble. Ah, oh, you are saying nonsense. So I think it's really helpful Thank that you. you make this distinction now more clear and it helps me to grasp it better to well stop it. okay let's hear to the end yeah and i think um mm -hmm. i mean you're a loving and believing person and i was uh, you were very kind to hear me out but mm. this difficulty of saying look god does not have to be good is significant but that's not saying god is not good but it's just mm -hmm. saying yes. in, in the in the psalms there are psalms like we're David, King David says, uh, hey, God, you know, it's very bad here. You need to bail me out. You need to save me. Otherwise, you're going to look very bad. <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. So that's a natural thing. And so it's saying like, 
it's premature sometimes to praise God. I mean, there's virtue in praising God maybe under any circumstances, but in a certain honest sense, like if our honest testimony is important in that sense, like just to explain how it is, you know, I think it's more about us being creatures of God's for God's testimony. So at least in my view of God as an investigator, God is an investigator. We arise to give our testimony what's going on. We have these choices, how to go. That's kind of like, so walking with you on this path to try to understand, does this make sense? You know, can I, I think that's very, your fellowship is very, uh, and even praying together, you know, and such is very um, important. And Jesus's example is extremely um, crucial. I don't know how I would manage without that. I think uh, very uh, important. And so theoretically, though, this seems to come up in four different ways, this equation that I call. Um, one is in terms of the spirit, pretty much as I said. And so this distinction between God and everything, to say, well, uh, often when I was like 17, 18, I would just focus on everything, trying to de-spiritualize it, de-mystify or de-theologize you know, it, just to say, well, and that's how I ended up these divisions of everything. Those are structural things. But kind of saying, well, is it the same as God or not? Well, is you know what is the difference? Then realizing, well, there's a very subtle difference. Um, and it comes up in the divisions of everything, where it's one thing to have a division of everything into one perspective. And basically, that's like everything or order for issues of order. But there's also an option to have division of everything with no perspectives. And so that's a technically like a good way to um, work with God or think of God. And, and even you can even imagine having a neural map in the brain where it has these different perspectives, but it has one that we can't experience through any perspective. But it says, you know, there's issues of God that can be, um, the brain can be aware of, uh, that's part of our mental journey. So as we cycle through, so um, the idea that structure, so everything is a structure of God, God is the spirit of everything, you know, God removes himself, yields everything, that's how it would be in my understanding, you know, everything is created, let's say. And then through this transcendent process, likewise, where God is going beyond himself into himself, removing himself, you get this notion of wishing as particular scopes. So these are conceptions that you can look at this process close up where God is um, has not gone anywhere. So that's the scope of nothing, but then into something, anything, everything, like inside, you know, creating this whole everything world. So... I would call that uh, wishes of different orders, which was relevant in defining those reservations. And then the unity of all those would be love. Uh, so when we unify the self-sufficiency and the and the uh, certainty and the calmness and the loving, it's the love that actually you know is the unity. And so the unity is actually in the complete unfolding. That's love. And so technically, uh, in the philosophy, to say that when you when it says that God is love, then for me, technically, I unpack that as saying that uh, uh, love is the unity of the conceptions of the structure of God. Okay, so that's just my technical language. But um, so we have God, everything wishing love. We have this uh, spirit, structure, um, conceptions, and unity. And on all four levels, um, we can have uh, the same equation that I had given. Um, where So instead of saying God does not have to be good, it would be saying, well, Instead of God, we talk about everything. Instead of good, the structure of good is slack, this looseness, which could be increasing or decreasing when we conceive it. So everything and slack, everything plus slack is anything. Anything is everything plus slack. So you you kind of give yourself a little bit of room, and then you can see everything from one point, basically. If you just give yourself a little wiggle room, you can. So that would be anything, kind of like from that kind of vantage point. Otherwise, you got to be like godly, all-encompassing, all things at all time, which is very foreign to us. Um, but wisdom is being able to realize that uh, everything in Slack can be separated. So it's able to look at anything and say, hey, 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 let's separate this out. Let's tease this out. What is from the beyond and what is from within? That's wisdom. Um, and then um, wishing um, and I, so wishing or identifying is choosing. So Slack can be increasing or decreasing. Like if you look at the example of Jesus, uh, Jesus can be uh, uh, identified with a person. You know, it's like a person in general who all people are equivalent to in some very human sense. 
And so he was able to be a representative of all humanity, but also he's equivalent to God. Uh, so this very so through Jesus, we have this um, uh, indirect equivalence with God, kind of like a God living through us, a God within our depths, this godling that I talked about. Uh, so this is two different types of identities. Um, uh, and and it would be like increasing slack, decreasing slack. But so if you take those and you combine them, and I won't maybe elaborate on this, but it's it's it, choosing. The kinds of choices we make fall into those two types. Uh, and so, but goodwill is being able to separate that out. Uh, so showing goodwill. Um, my father had a beautiful expression, um, always show goodwill. This is Rodi Garavala in Lithuanian. So it's just saying, give somebody a little bit of slack see what they do with it, give them a little bit more, see what they do with it. Uh, my corollary is never give too much, just give the tiniest amount. You know, that's all you need. Uh, don't get tired. But always give it a little bit of slack for uh, them to show who they are and to be themselves maybe, and then you can accommodate them maybe, hopefully. Um, so uh, goodwill is, and then God's will. Uh, okay, so the unities of all this, well, the unity of the wishings of, you know, with regard to God, it's all love. Perfection is this uh, unity of the identifications. Uh, the will, the human will, is the unity of the ways of choosing, which would be like choosing yes, choosing no, choosing not yes, choosing not no, choosing to choose, choosing to not choose, I think. Um, and then I think just choosing and not choosing can be added to, to all that. But the point is, like, when you combine those six types of choosing, that's that's the will. But God's will would be saying that love and perfection can be disconnected. Like the human will loves the perfect, but God's will is able to love beyond that, love the imperfect, you know, just love in general, love unconditionally. And so this whole notion that, uh, oh, God's will is better than our will in the sense that we could be loving the imperfect, not just uh, in our instinctive way, loving the perfect. Also, um, this relationship between well, goodwill and the good heart, like uh, that goodwill opens up the way for the good heart. So inside of us, there's this godly goodness, but we keep it locked up. We hide it. We cover it. We block the way. Uh, it's some kind of godly goodness deep inside of us. So goodwill opens up the way for the for the good heart in us and other people and allows that to connect. So this is how the same thing is coming in each of these levels. Like maybe I, 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 this is not the place. I've, I've actually given videos where I think I've elaborated maybe more um, helpfully and, and, uh, and in detail. But you're familiar with this, I think, um, more or less. Any comments on all this? I think that in some way you try to tell it, I mean, in the last years, in the last several years. Yeah. So I think I have some pictures, but I didn't look at any of the videos. So. No, that's fine. Commenting about the videos is not. No, no, <laughs> that's fine. And this is these are all things that are you know you have to keep going back through them and improving them or working on them or thinking about them, reflecting about it. But this four by four matrix is very important. And and for example, um, Jerry Northrup has a four by four matrix, and I try to emphasize to him that it's actually this. It's interesting that he has that. This is a way where we may be connecting. Um, I don't know, but. Um, um, so the reason I wanted to point that out was uh, now I want to go to where I'm going. So these four investigations by God and how could they relate to the four investigations by humans? Let's just delve in here. One of the things in trying to make sense of the whole big picture, where does it all you know, come together? What is this all about? Uh, one thing I found helpful was this notion of um, uh, God as the indefinite, uh, going beyond into the definite, which basically allows for humanity, uh, then through humanity, let's say, allowing for the imaginable, and then going back out as the unimaginable. So these types of notions, um, which are not very well, maybe well defined, but this is the like in in creating this system of definitions, there is something very helpful about starting with the indefinite, basically something to say, well, we're, you know, we have the undefined or the indefinite uh, and there's something godly about that. Uh, um, there's so many ways to try to um, start with God as a starting point, you know, like the, the unconditional, let's say uh, the um, 
uh, the non-subjective, let's say, uh, the uh, there's different ways, but this is the one that actually uh, seems to help for the big picture in the most uh, in the most unifying way. But one of the things I learned, okay, so um, the question is um, how to relate, and there'll be 24-fold sciences, I'll go back to those, relating to the uh, indefinite, the definite, the imaginable, the unimaginable. And that's basically going to be like these persons, God, I, you, and the third person I call other. So how would they relate to that, uh, these four? And one of the things, um, I think this is the drawing, maybe that would explain it, maybe. I kind of, so when I have God and I and you and other, on the one hand, there's this a very helpful thing. Okay, there's a perspective. I put P, perspective on a perspective, and a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. Uh, so I kind of like wrote it in this way. And so God goes to I, goes to you, goes to other, which becomes like very distant and objective in some kind of way. And so if you think of God as an investigator, by the time you get to other, you have this scientific type of mindset, type of world, where it's all these objective observers, let's say, whereas God himself is intimately subjective, uh, absolutely subjective, there really isn't anything else, uh, not even any context for that uh, in the beginning, um, if, if if making as few assumptions as possible. Now, so there's a science for each of these things, a 24-fold science, and I'll, I'll show that, but somehow I'm trying to relate it to the human chain, and with the human um, structures, there's this idea of levels of understanding that there's, it starts with understanding and then self-understanding and then shared understanding and then good understanding and kind of like uh, understand, maybe to explain good understanding being the way, the wisdom of the wise child. Uh, so when the child is lost, um, but the wise child when they're lost realizes, hey, I'm the child, they're the parent. They should be looking for me. I shouldn't be looking for them. If I look for them, you know, that's just too prideful. Like, I could get way more lost. I could make things much more difficult. You know, I need to help them find me. So I should go where they would find me, or I should just go nowhere and stay put. Um, but if you pack all, unpack all that, it's like the human's view of God's view of the human's view of God's view of human's view, or like the child's view of the parent's view of the child's view of the parent's view of the child's view, sorting out like, what is it that the parents are thinking about me and what I'm thinking about them, and so on. Um, I've, uh, I won't try to unpack that too closely, but the point being that what this whole um, like understanding would be the human's view of God's view. And I talk about, you know, that's basically related to this God dance, but then it's human's view of God's view of human's view. And that would be self-understanding. So how, how I see God seeing me. But then uh, human's view of God's view of human's view of God's view. So like how I see God seeing me seeing, let's say through God, like that, well, this is equivalent for everybody or like this is everybody. But then this rapport, like human's view of God's view of human's view of God's view of human's view to say, and nevertheless, I still am the child. You know, it's asymmetric. It's not symmetric. So when I look um, with those structures, those human structures seem to relate to this chain of perspectives uh, with levels of understanding. Whereas like the, the four persons come from this simpler chain of perspectives. Now, one thing I noticed was that if I look at those four uh, intuitive uh, frameworks, the reservations, um, like good understanding basically is about um, how human will and God's will uh, line up with each other. So that would be that uh, eightfold way, for example. And so shared understanding uh, might be like in terms of those emotional systems, uh, how do we, um, and then self-understanding might be in terms of our cognitive intelligence. And then understanding might be simply with uh, with the those um, that with those needs and operating systems. That's just you know and a, a lot of this is aesthetic. I'm just playing with my hunches or observations or 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 interpolating based on what I noticed. But I feel pretty good about that. That that's good. Now, and as I said, you know, uh, here's God uh, wishes for nothing is self sufficient. Wishes for something is certain. Wishes for anything is calm. Wishes for everything is loving. And I had mentioned before. Oh, 
if you take those four frameworks and then you uh, have God empathize from different levels, uh, maybe um, levels with smaller scope, then you will get um, these um, six structures, the three static families, the divisions, conception, circumstances, and the three languages, all the structures that are basically helping to understand a person's life in terms of the third person, so to speak, um, that will be, um, that will be all, all come out. And so I think the two breakthroughs I wanted to tell you about, because I like to share my research, and it kind of helped me feel comfortable that maybe things are uh, filling together, although then I found I'm kind of confused about some things, but there were two breakthroughs. One was realizing, hmm, I think, you know, God is evolving out and creating the conditions for human, transcending himself thereby. Human is going to transcend himself, reaching out to God, kind of like how those intuitive frameworks set that up. But the deal is this, that when human reaches back to God, it seems that he starts in good understanding, in the full thing uh, I had not expected that. I kind of assumed the other way around, that it builds out. But actually, there's good re there's reasons to think that actually humans wake up, let's say, in full consciousness. You know, humans start off in consciousness and then they lose their consciousness uh, in better or worse ways as they see fit. And it runs out. And then they're kind of like thrown into consciousness again. Where consciousness being that state where your, your two minds are balanced, uh, which... Um, if you have a dilemma in life, you know, and you have to worry, like, what do I do? Do I rely on my instincts or do I, you know, think it through logically? Um, everyone's going to have those types of situations. So everyone is forced into this uh, moment of consciousness where you have to kind of decide which way you're going to lean. Um, but people like me, like, I like to be in the state of consciousness. I like to live a deliberate life. And so I try to make my choices in order to keep myself as deliberate as possible, as often as possible. So... And it kind of works that way that I'm back in that, you know, consciousness is a flickering thing. People who like it maybe have more of that flickering. You know, people who don't, maybe they they, they don't flicker all that much, um, you know, on a rare occasions, let's say. So the point is, is that when we have that uh, full and, and the full thing is that to say the, 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 the beginning state of consciousness, look, I'm the child. God is the parent, you know, like I'm just a child. So what do I do? And so. By choosing, like, whether either to apply one of these languages or that, which is how it starts out, or you can later maybe choose one of these um, uh, frameworks. But that's kind of like setting, recording, documenting, or preserving the decisions that you're making in life. They're becoming, um, your choices are being made in life. You know, how to, how to, how to, um, what to do with your consciousness, you know, how to, manifest it as you lose it. And Jesus has a saying, he goes, you know, I lay down my life and I pick it back up again. So this type of uh, attitude, um, you know, I, I spend my consciousness and then I retrieve it. Uh, I get it back somehow. So that would kind of make sense. And so that was one breakthrough was to realize it could be unraveling like that. Another breakthrough was to realize... Um, and then that kind of helps me understand better how to think of these languages. Um, and then um, I forget what the other breakthrough would be, but that's. But then a question came, I guess. So that was maybe the the gist of the thing. But the question came. Oh, then another breakthrough is to say, hey, oh, this is another breakthrough. This is kind of important to realize. This thing of the indefinite, definite, imaginable, imaginable, you see, that's how God's life, God's growth looks from the side. That's not how God looks at that. Like the way God looks at it is back in God's dance, where God just says, am I necessary, let's say, and you go through, and it's very personal, like I and you and other. This whole idea that, oh, God starts off as the indefinite, that's a very cold and kind of like very uh, objective, so to speak, and very distant way of looking at it. That seems to be the way of looking at it if you were from the other's point of view, you know, or if you were from the... So what seems to be happening in these sciences is that each science looks at God's transcendence, but from another person's point of view, from the point of view of I or you or another, from a different starting point. So from the point of view of other, it would just be this indefinite, definite, imaginable, imaginable. So then that suggests, hey, 
this may all sit in the science, or this may actually be, so to speak, the science of love that I'm looking for, that I've not made progress of, is this is describing it. And it would be a summary of all the other, I mean, kind of like the, uh, um, it would include all of the other sciences within it. So it would be talking about all the sciences, including itself, uh, the un about the unimaginable. And it would be wrapping all this together and relating all of that. So as we go through each of these, um, God would become more distant, you know, less direct, you know, through I, through you, through other, with each of these sciences. But also, we would have the connection between God and human would become more explicit, uh, more channels. So in the beginning, there's like no channel. It's just happening in parallel uh, from God's point. I mean, maybe beginning is the wrong word, but here on the leftmost side, then there's one channel in the cognition, two channels in the emotional and three channels with the will. So when God rolls all that out, we have this three-channel relationship, which is relevant for relating the human will with God's will, as in the Lord's Prayer and all these possibilities. But then as we lose our consciousness, so we go from the consciousness to unconscious, I mean to conscious to unconscious to to let's say just there, let's say, not even unconscious, just physically there. But when when we do all that, um we're um we're rolling it back we're 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 just i guess i don't know rolling it back up or, or however it is um but we're ending back up where we were like it's 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 back maybe it's just rolling back up the question is how we're doing it and what's left of that and etc and that's to be maybe determined more by these languages etc so i think um maybe i'll just have that thought any thoughts from you on this regard i cannot really follow what breakthrough it is because to me it didn't seem to change a lot from what you told several years ago so mm -hmm. well it I think might be more clear that might be the breakthrough I don't know but so that yeah. maybe and you know this is techno maybe just for me just for to you as a friend yeah I was probably presuming you know I was looking for a connection between God and human um but I was probably presuming that you know they unfold in the same direction uh with regard to these things but now i'm thinking um this whole thing actually must be in the other direction um although sometimes i talk about both directions See, and, and also it's very interesting you get this eightfold uh cycle like you would with bot you know with the divisions of everything or like sometimes in math i'm looking for bot periodicity you get this eightfold cycle but you also have this Eight sum, which collapses to the null sum, this logical square with four corners and four sides, which is not tenable because if all are good and all are bad, you get an empty system. You have that eightfold structure, which is self-contradictory and collapses. But then I'm thinking that these eightfold intuitive uh, families, these reservations, are kind of like conceptions um, expressing that in particular scope. So you get four plus two equals six of these eightfold structures. And that's kind of like what the conceptions, how they work. Um, they have this four plus two um, setup. So um, I guess this is just machinery, you know, and in, in, in the big picture, maybe. Um, oh, and I guess the other breakthrough is to think, oh, maybe this is all sitting in the uh, in in the God's in the uh, science of love. And so maybe I'll just conclude here because I think this is the uh, this is enough of. I'll just dash through this here. The system to saying like when you have a system, you have the four plus six. It just it happens in different ways, and you have qualities of signs, and you have uh, you have visualizations, and you have uh, it comes up uh, in transformations in geometry, and it comes up in parsing things in different levels, and even in the Ten Commandments, you have this four plus six. So. I, I've talked about that, and maybe that's not uh, crucial now, but um, just to conclude, I think, um, with these 24-fold sciences, so I've told you about uh, God's dance, and you were there, I was working on that. Then this flow of experience, mm -hmm. I talked about that, and collecting data, how that would look like from um, personal experiences. So that's a whole thing to investigate. And then uh, from the point of view of you, you get this myriad, you know, millions of or billions of or hundreds of billions of houses of knowledge. So every personality, every scientific discipline, 
uh, has a house of knowledge. And so I collect them and they all basically have the same form and they have the same form as that. And so then the question is the science of love. How do I do that? So you have these different kinds of oneness, um, like shared fates, but that individual morally individual fates is a better way to go. And then individual dreams and then going back to a shared dream. Uh, that's a whole other topic. But so the science of love, it should kind of give like, those are like onenesses, and it should kind of give like 24 different kinds of onenesses, but also 24 different kinds of um, truth. So, you know, there's lots of theories of truth, um, what is truth. Uh, and so I haven't completed this chart, but but basically there's the same kind of thing. It all fits together. And so I'm mean, looking like in terms of love, like how does it relate to oneness? How does it relate to truth? But basically the idea is that this thing I showed you, I'm talking about you, I kind of suspect it fits in here. And I think it's what it's doing, it's supporting this question of we. And these questions of oneness, uh, when I was organizing about 10 years ago or 14 years ago, uh, I was organizing thousands of my questions, like what are they all about? And I got these kinds of onenesses, like uh, they're all questions, like how to relate the perspectives of God and other, how can love support eternal personal growth? How can God reach every single person? How do perspectives coincide? How to derive everything from any single individual? How to describe everything in terms of concerns? Those are like the ways of onenesses. So this is maybe to say like the kinds of questions I'm working on. Uh, one thing in conclusion that I did was um, just um, uh, write questions out. So if someone visits this, they'll be able to look at all the types of questions I'm asking. But I think for these videos, this is enough for now. Any thoughts on all this, Thomas? Thank you for walking with me on this overview. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think it's a hard work to let others participate in your thinking mm -hmm. in a way where you are no longer micromanaging the understanding and saying yes that's right yes that's not right but mm -hmm. leaving it as what you have as some maybe it's not a book but what you say now is a library of films a library of explanations at some point it will stay as it is mm -hmm. and i think that I don't know how to say, but I wonder how other people that don't have the direct contact with you and go through your discussions that they understand or not understand what you mean, perceive it and how it can bear fruit even if they don't reach out to you. So, I mean, you told at some point that you want to make this something like the, the book for scouts. Mm. And I think you were choosing now a different medium to do it. So maybe it works out, but I have no clue how, how it is. I'm in that sense wondering and puzzled. But it could be that it's a new way of having now an audio and video book to look up what you have and you collect how you explain it. So it might be really steps in that direction. So that's a great uh, observation. And, you know, of course, invite people to leave comments uh, because I'm, I'm sure yeah. people have something to say about that. Um, but this is really great um, for, we have a small community, you know, and so uh, you and I have a personal relationship that goes back and I'm, you know, you sometimes you join us, but but the idea being that uh, there are people like Jerry, um, uh, Kirby, um, Daniel, um, who are trying to understand what am I talking about in a um, friendly way, and so uh, I think these videos will be great just to see like that there's somebody who understands the you know understands maybe not the right word but who can uh, receive let's say the advanced wondrous wisdom and kind of like engage it and 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 you know look at it uh, kind of like a art work or or like anyways however it happened but some but i'm able to express myself in a way that you know 
I don't think with any other person in the world I could because you've really given the energy to uh, follow me for all these years and I can just dash through these mm -hmm. things that you know, you've know you heard much about from before. Uh, so I, I can bring to you uh, advances that I'm making and then you'll listen to that. It's very uh, sweet. Uh, and so I've made maybe about 20 videos so far. So I'll probably at this point being able to make more videos just about little research project progress I'm making, you know, mm -hmm. because I tried to do that uh, nine months ago and I realized I have to explain some things, right? And so now yeah. I'll do that without explaining things, just go off into whatever I'm working on. So that's one. But the other is that uh, we have a steering committee now. Uh, we uh, have um, desire to like work on some small projects and all of a sudden jerry like wrote a letter where he's talking about the two some three some four some in his own way he's applying it now if mm -hmm. you think about it as a language club it's just very early days you know but maybe half a year from now we'll really be able to use those types of ideas and really be communicating uh things that are um uh really make me think oh that's great that's a great mm -hmm. insight uh so uh, it's it's this language club where actually Kirby and others are starting to be in okay speaking their first words, participating in this language beginning you know, so that is really more important than me doing my research if this is going to be meaningful because any kind of things I would ever discover are things other people can discover probably, but so long yeah. as this is a lie, oh, you know, but so long as this is alive, like if there's a community of people who can figure out, hey, this is real, you know, it's really the question of is this real or not? But if there's a community that kind of like is able to demonstrate, you know, this is real, we can speak this language, we can discover things with this language, everything else will be achieved, I think. So I, I think it's healthy for me to keep uh, on the forefront. Okay. So maybe we have 30 seconds. Could you end us with a prayer? Yeah. Lord. I ask you that you take in your hand what you want to form out of what Andrews works on. That it is really a representation of you that people find when they look and try to understand what Andrews presents. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi weekly or bi weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.